5. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 13th, 1872. The party, my dear Jack, was as dreary as possible. A lieutenant of the Navy, the rector of the Episcopal Church at Stillwater, and a society swell from Nahant. The lieutenant looked as if he had swallowed a couple of his buttons, and found the bullion rather indigestible. The rector was a pensive youth of the Daffy Down Dilly sort, and the swell from Nahant was a very weak tidal wave indeed. The women were much better, as they always are. The two Miss Kingsburys of Philadelphia, staying at the Seashell House, two bright and engaging girls. But Marjorie Daw! The company broke up soon after tea, and I remained to smoke a cigar with the colonel on the piazza. It was like seeing a picture to see Miss Marjorie hovering around the old soldier and doing a hundred gracious little things for him. She brought the cigars and lighted the tapers with her own delicate fingers in the most enchanting fashion. As we sat there, she came and went in the summer twilight and seemed, with her white dress and pale gold hair, like some lovely phantom that had sprung into existence out of the smoke wreaths. If she had melted into air, like the statue of Galatea in the play, I should have been more sorry than surprised. It was easy to perceive that the old colonel worshipped her and she him. I think the relation between an elderly father and a daughter just blooming into womanhood the most beautiful possible. There is in it a subtle sentiment that cannot exist in the case of mother and daughter, or that of son and mother. But this is getting into deep water. I sat with the Dawes until half-past ten, and saw the moon rise on the sea. The ocean, that had stretched motionless and black against the horizon, was changed by magic into a broken field of glittering ice, interspersed with marvelous silvery fjords. In the far distance the Isle of Shoals loomed up like a group of huge bergs drifting down on us. The polar regions in a June thaw. It was exceedingly fine. What did we talk about? We talked about the weather. And you. The weather has been disagreeable for several days past, and so have you. I glided from one topic to the other very naturally. I told my friends of your accident, how it had frustrated all our summer plans, and what our plans were. I played quite a spirited solo on the fibula. Then I described you. Or rather, I didn't. I spoke of your amiability, of your patience under this severe affliction, of your touching gratitude when Dylan brings you little presents of fruit, of your tenderness to your sister Fanny, whom you would not allow to stay in town to nurse you, and how you heroically sent her back to Newport, preferring to remain alone with Mary the cook and your man Watkins, to whom, by the way, you were devotedly attached. If you had been there, Jack, you wouldn't have known yourself. I should have excelled as a criminal lawyer if I had not turned my attention to a different branch of jurisprudence. Miss Marjorie asked all manner of leading questions concerning you. It did not occur to me then, but it struck me forcibly afterwards that she evinced a singular interest in the conversation. When I got back to my room, I recalled how eagerly she leaned forward, with her full snowy throat in strong moonlight, listening to what I said. Positively, I think I made her like you. Miss Daw is a girl whom you would like immensely, I can tell you that a beauty without affectation, a high and tender nature, if one can read the soul in the face. And the old colonel is a noble character, too. I am glad that the Dawes are such pleasant people. The Pines is an isolated spot, and my resources are few. I fear I should have found life here somewhat monotonous before long, with no other society than that of my excellent sire. It is true I might have made a target of the defenseless invalid, but I haven't a taste for artillery, moi. 